open up to John this evening. John 1. We'll get there in just a few minutes. We've wrapped up our look at the inner circle of disciples. I'm, I'm calling it tiers. We have three tiers of disciples with four disciples in each. The top tier we would call the inner circle disciples. They're the ones we know the most about. They're the ones who were the closest to Jesus. They're the ones who uh, spent the most time in close proximity, especially, you remember Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John were the ones who went in with him to heal Jer Jairus' daughter. They're the ones who went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're the ones who went deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane. So we have those, those top-tier inner circle disciples. Uh, we have Peter, who's the leader, kind of impetuous. Uh, we have Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He's a man with a passion for bringing others into contact with Jesus. He's going to play into what we look at here this evening. We have James. James is the elder brother making up the duo, the sons of thunder. And then we have John. John is the younger of the sons of Zebedee, who refers to himself in the gospel that bears his name only as that disciple or as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He doesn't ever name himself uh, in a story. Uh, kind, of, kind of interesting. We talked about that last week, so I won't re-preach it. But now we come to the next tier of four disciples. And we have Philip, Nathaniel, Matthew, or Levi, and Thomas. We know less about these men than we know about the first four, but certainly we know enough about these men that we can draw some application and some lessons for our lives. The apostles are listed four times in Scripture. The, the apostles that we're talking about, they're listed four times. <clears throat> Usually when, when Jesus is selecting them, there's the list, and it just gives their names. And the, the names shift a little bit. Sometimes you'll find uh, the, the names in the tiers kind of scrambled a little bit, but they're always in the tiers. But Andrew is always listed at number five. He is always in that, that slot in all of the places where the disciples are listed. Some people believe perhaps he was kind of the de facto leader of the second tier disciples. We know a little bit about him. And tonight, if you will allow, I'm going to, uh, we're, we're going to infer some things about Philip. We can, we can read about him. We can know particular things about him from the context and from things that are said about the situations where we find him. First off, his name, the name Philip, it's the, the Greek word philopos. It means a lover of horses. So not a whole lot of spiritual application there. But we do know that that is a Greek name. Now we know that all of the disciples were Jews. All of the apostles, it was 12 Jewish men. All of them were also from Galilee. Only one of them was from Judea. His name was, do you remember? His name was Judas. Judas is the only one who's not from the region of Galilee. So we have the 12 Jewish apostles, but Philip's name is Greek. And while some of them bore uh, Greek names, were always given their Hebrew names except for Philip. Meaning he went by his Greek name, which would lead us to assume that he would be a Hellenistic Jew. We were talking about this. The Greeks had ruled the world prior to Rome, and their impact on culture and language was profound, lasting up to the time of Christ and far beyond. We were talking about this a little bit earlier, uh, just as we were sitting here. Uh, if you look at the foundation of the United States of America, the Greek culture has a lot of, of input. There's a lot of impact from the Greek culture even on the founding of the United States. With a name like Philip, and that he went by Philip, not by some other Hebrew name, would indicate to us that very likely he was born into a family of Hellenistic Jews. The Hellenistic Jews were Jews who were born abroad and then they still spoke the Greek language. And, and you'll see why I think this is the case even further when we get a little bit further into this message. Paul was a Hellenistic Jew. 
Paul was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, which would be Asia Minor. And he came down, he learned, he was educated in Jerusalem, but he spoke Greek. That would have been his, his primary tongue. Now, he was also fluent in Hebrew and Aramaic, no doubt. But he was a Greek-speaking Jew, a Hellenistic Jew, very likely. Philip was as well. We read in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, that the first deacons were chosen because of a rift that had arisen within the church because of the neglect of the widows of the Hellenistic Jews, or they are also called the Grecian Jews. Let me read it to you just so you hear what I'm talking about. Acts 6 verse 1 says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. They're both Hebrews. They're both Jews. But the Grecians are Hellenistic Jews born abroad. They came here. So there's there's kind of a, uh, a little bit of friction there from time to time. The, the, the way that, uh, because they're not natives, they're not natives to Israel. So a little bit of, not, not animosity, but there's, there's a difference there. If somebody were to come here to, to Iowa from San Francisco, you know, right here to this area, they say, I'm adopting Iowa as my home. This is, this is it. This is what I love. This is... Would there be a difference? Well, yeah, because they were born in a different place. And the fact that they're from California, you might look at them suspiciously, perhaps, right? That's kind of how it was. So, so Jews, take Jews like Ukraine or Poland or much of Israel would be people would stand back. Oh, absolutely. Would, would all different people still be Hellenistic or does that be the Greek? The, it, the Hellenistic would be just for the Greek. Just the Greek. Yeah, okay. yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Most of the Jews who <laughs> inhabit Israel today are immigrants from other places. Jewish in by birth, because you have to be blood. Jewish blood. I, I don't remember. I think it's half. You have to have before you can even become a, an Israeli citizen. So, yeah. So it's important to recognize that this is not the Philip. Who, led, who was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch. That different Philip. This is Philip the apostle. The guy who led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord was Philip the deacon. Uh, he also goes by Philip the evangelist. And he, he's in the book of Acts. This Philip is found in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of John, which is where you're turned. And let's see, we have some old friendships that we'll look at here first. John chapter 1 verse 43 says... The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find <clears throat> Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Bethsaida is on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, just as a note, because maybe you, maybe you remember from looking at Peter, Peter's family would settle in Capernaum. Capernaum is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and that's where Peter would place, that's where his house is, that's where he, he called home when he was married and his, his mother-in-law lived there in the house with them in Capernaum. But Peter was originally from Bethsaida. So Peter and Andrew and also Philip, all from this same small town. It's not certain, but there's reason to believe that Philip was also a fisherman. We don't know that uh, exactly, because the Bible doesn't give us, it, it doesn't spell it out like it does for Peter. But it's believed that, you remember, all the way at the end of the Gospels, after, uh, after the resurrection, but before the disciples really were, were in communion with Jesus, Peter said, I'm going fishing. You remember that, that story in the Gospels? And he went, and James and John and Andrew went, went with him. Another of the disciples who said, I'm going fishing too, was Philip. And so many people believe that he was going because that had been his profession as well. His relation with Peter and Andrew would have been a fairly close one. They almost certainly have attended the same synagogue. If Philip was indeed a fisherman, their paths would have certainly crossed in the fish markets. 
and out on the, on the lake as well. The, the Sea of Galilee is a big body of water, but it's not so big that you wouldn't run into people. It's interesting that Jesus would call as his disciples a group of men who likely knew and were friendly with each other and in the same geographical area. Those are the, the followers of Jesus. This was a camaraderie, I believe, that would, would help them and would, would aid them in the monumental task that was before them. The, the fact that they, for the most part, they were from the same area, they had a lot in common. That, that does kind of come into play in the, the broader story of the Gospels of Christ. But let's look at the, the call, actually, of Philip. It's the same verses that we've just looked at here in John 1. John 1 contains the call of Peter and Andrew in verses 37 to verse 42. And many scholars believe John to be the other unnamed disciple in verses 37 and 40. Uh, the, the one who was there with Andrew when he heard John the Baptist uh, say, There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus' approach to Philip was very similar. Only we have no record that Philip had met Christ prior to his calling. Andrew had met and talked, uh, had talked to, to, I'm sorry, Peter and Andrew had met and talked to Jesus before he and Peter were called. But, but Jesus approached Philip and his reputation as, at this point, just kind of a celebrity. Jesus was a celebrity at this point and his reputation would have preceded him. But there's still quite a decision for Philip to make, given what, he, what we're about to see. It's obvious that Philip was a student of the scriptures and that he was seeking truth. Again, even though he wasn't a <coughs> scholar, he's not a religious leader, Philip was a devout man who would have spent time in the scriptures. And to a student of the scriptures, it was no secret that the Messiah would be coming upon the stage at any, any moment. If that's, you remember Simeon at the birth of Christ and Anna at the birth of Christ? You, you say, well, why, why didn't other people realize that it was the time for the Messiah to come? Well, I don't know, because they should have. Because if you read the prophecies of the Old Testament, you can figure it up pretty precisely when Messiah is going to arrive. So to a devout student of Scripture, it wouldn't have come as any surprise that this is the time for the Messiah to come onto the stage. And Philip is likely among that number. When Philip heard about Jesus and his ministry, Philip, being a devout Jew, would have been a man who, who would have started kind of going through his mind with, this is what I'm hearing about Jesus, and this is what the prophecies foretold. And kind of comparing the two. This is what, this is what I'm seeing this is what the Bible says. Yes? So when you said that, it kind of reminds me of rapture. Everybody, the Bible says it. It's in the prophecy. But nobody sees them. Nobody sees them. Yeah. You know. The only difference is, is that you can be so much more precise as to the coming of Messiah because of the Daniel's 70 weeks. You can figure it out because it says from the time when this decree goes forth, and we know when that decree was, until the time of this is going to be this long. So you could be, I mean, essentially you could get your calendar and you could say, okay, we're getting real close. Now, they would also know that Messiah is, has to be born and grow up, but they wouldn't have known. So they wouldn't have known, you know, this is the day when Messiah is born. But they could know the general idea of Messiah has to be alive right now because the, the, the prophecy tells us that the Messiah is going to be cut off at this particular time. So... They, a student of scripture could have looked at what the Bible says and say, this is, this is all in line. And I believe that Philip, you'll see why I'm saying this in just a moment. Philip was a man who had done his homework. Philip was, he's a, he's a numbers guy. When Jesus finally came to Philip and asked him to become his follower, Philip had already come to the conclusion that there's something special about this man. There's something different. Now, he didn't know all the details as you'll see in a moment. But we'll read, let's just read it one more time here in verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip 
was of Bethsaida and the city of Andrew and Peter. So we see his call and, and we see instant evangelism. Look at what proceeds here in verse four, or 45 says, uh, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Kind of interesting here because he, he says several things of note. He says, we have found him. Who, who's we? Well, he's talking about Peter, Andrew, James, and John. There are now five apostles, or five disciples at this point. They haven't been named as apostles yet. But five disciples of Jesus of Nazareth who, are, who have found the Messiah and they're following him. He, he runs to Nathaniel, and we're going to talk about Nathaniel next week, Lord willing. But he runs to Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, we, we found the man who fulfills the prophecies. You see what it says here? That's why I say he, he's a man who's done his research. We found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Now, there are some commentators who would say it's not accurate. We, now, we know that Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was born in what, what city? Bethlehem. Bethlehem of Judea. He was raised in Nazareth, the hometown of Mary and his adopted father, his legal father, Joseph. So he was called a, a Nazarene because he was from Nazareth. Not that he was born there, but because that was where he grew up. For, for me, I have a, a situation where I was born in North Carolina, and I lived in North Carolina until I was four years old. Then we moved to Pennsylvania. And I would do the next 20 years of my growing up in Pennsylvania. So, so if somebody says, what, what are you? Am I a North Carolinian or a Pennsylvanian? Well, I would say I'm probably more Pennsylvanian because that's where I grew up most of my life. So it is, Christ grew up in Nazareth, not in Bethlehem. He wasn't in Bethlehem very long before he went to Egypt. And then when they returned, they went to Nazareth. But the next phrase that he gives, Jesus of Nazareth, he's introducing Jesus to Nathaniel. He says, we found him. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Is that true? It's <laughs> kind but, but at the same time, it's, it's a legal matter in, in a way. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. But legally, Jesus is listed as the son of Joseph of Nazareth. That's why in, in the Gospels, we have the genealogy of Joseph. Because he was the legal father. He, he claimed Jesus not as his son, but he claimed Mary as his wife. And he raised Jesus. Jesus as his own. Philip, in this, in this moment, in this excited moment as he's telling Nathaniel, does he understand all the ins and outs of Jesus, the Son of God? Does he understand? No, I don't think so. He's, he's short on facts. He doesn't have a solid grounding in the truth. But I'll give him this much. Philip, at this point, he knows enough about Jesus of Nazareth to walk away from his livelihood and say, I'm going to follow this man. And that's commendable. That's noteworthy that he's willing to do this. Why is he willing to do that? Because he says here in verse 45, we found him. We found the one who, who fits all the criteria. A we prophecy. found Jesus. And he crosses off all of the boxes. What was that? A prophecy. A prophecy. We found the man who he, he fulfills all of the prophecies. There's something special about this Jesus of Nazareth. In this case, he calls him the son of Joseph. It's significant that Jesus' disciples have a heart of evangelism from the very, very beginning. Andrew did this. Andrew found Jesus. He went and told Peter. Philip finds Jesus. He immediately goes and talks with Nathaniel. We talk about what we believe in. We still do. When you find a product that works, you tell people about it. When they found the Messiah, they told people about it. Again, next week, we'll, we'll look more at this interaction. I'm not going to steal all of my thunder here. Because we're going to see look at the whole interaction between Andrew and Nathaniel. You can read ahead. 
But flip ahead to John 6 right now. Let's look at what we know about Andrew. So we see his calling. We know that he was from Bethsaida, where he would have rubbed shoulders with Peter and Andrew and James and John as well. In John 6, Jesus is ministering in Galilee, and he's surrounded by a multitude who was starting to get hungry. John 6, verse 5 says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, <laughs> it's interesting. Jesus addresses the question to Philip specifically. When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, who's the treasurer of the disciples? Judas, Judas is scared. Judas holds the bag. But as you read through the Gospels, what little we know of Philip, we get the idea that Philip had a gift for administration. So it seems as we go that that. Judas is the treasurer, and Philip kind of handles some of the logistics. I believe that's why Jesus looks at Philip. We'll get more evidence of that in a moment. Jesus knows what he's going to do. In this particular case, it tells us that in verse 6. He himself knew what he would do. But he allows Philip to crunch the numbers. Philip looks around. Philip has probably been watching this crowd arrive. Philip doesn't have a watch, but he knows reasonably what time it is. It's getting later in the day. He looks. He says, boy, there's a lot of people. And, uh, and McDonald's is not open right now, right? So he's looking around. He knows He knows what's coming. And Philip, he, he looks. He starts grouping people because he, he has to get a count because Jesus just asked him. So he's getting a count. And he's looking around. And he, he crunches the numbers. He does the math. He's obviously pretty good at math. Verse 6, Philip answered him. 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Now, real quick, note, Jesus isn't asking Philip for a plan, because Jesus already has one. Jesus wasn't wondering what Philip was thinking, because Jesus knows what Philip is thinking. Jesus asks this question for Philip's benefit, not for his own. Jesus, whenever God asks a question, he's not asking for his information. He's asking for our information. In the garden, right after the fall, God was walking in the garden and he called out, Adam, where are you? Had God misplaced Adam? No, but Adam had misplaced himself. <laughs> Jacob, when he was wrestling with the angel of the Lord at Peniel that night before he would meet Esau, the angel of the Lord said, what is thy name? Did God know who he was wrestling with? Without a doubt. Why did he ask? Well, because it was for his information. And here in this passage, Jesus asks Philip this question so that Philip will have to realize something. Not because Jesus is at a loss. Jesus knows what he's going to do. Without reading too much into what's not written, it's entirely possible that Philip was prone to seeing problems in the midst of opportunity rather than opportunity in the midst of problems. Have you ever met somebody like that? They can, they, somebody says, well, there's a silver lining around every dark cloud. And some people, they, for all the world, cannot focus on the silver lining. All they see is the dark cloud. Now, I'm not making a general statement, but Philip, what should Philip have been excited about right here? This crowd is. This is awesome. Look at all the people who are going to hear truth. But what is Philip not excited about? How on earth are we going to feed all these people? He's looking at the numbers, again, because he's an analytical man, rather than looking at the numbers as a positive. Philip is crunching numbers, he's establishing what's impossible. One commentator said it this way he said, he knew too much arithmetic to be adventurous. That's, that's very definitely a good description of Philip. Philip was blinded by the temporal so much that he missed the supernatural. Now, we've already looked at what happens here. Andrew was standing nearby. And Andrew walked up, and he was bringing with him a little boy who had a lunch. And he said, here's a little boy who has five loaves and, and two fish, but what are these among so many? You say, well, that sounds faithless. Hey, at least he brought the boy. He brought the boy to Jesus. 
And we know the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. This was a good lesson for Philip especially. Because Philip, this would be one of those teaching experiences where, where the next time they were facing a, 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 a big crowd or kind of an insurmountable problem, and Jesus looks at Philip, he says, what are we going to do? The next time Philip should say, I don't know what we're going to do, but I know that you can do something because you're God. <laughs> so a good learning experience, but we know that this is all part of the, the building process of the apostles. The next place that we find Philip is John 12. Flip ahead to there. John 12, verse 20. And there came certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. And the same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Again, the fact that they would come to Philip, he's probably the man with the schedule and the protocol manual. On this occasion, it's significant that the Greeks would come to Philip. Why would the Greeks come to Philip? Because he's a Hellenist, because he goes by Philip. That's a Greek name. If, uh, if a Chinese person were to walk into a group and there's a person who has a very obviously Chinese name, a Chinese person would probably gravitate towards that person for information. There's, there's nothing racist or, or, or anything about it. It's just the way humans are kind of wired. So these Greeks, they come in. And they, they say, we're looking for, we heard that one of you is called Philip. Where's Philip? And they're pointing at what he's right over there. They go over to Philip. We'd like to, we'd like to meet Jesus. What should Philip's response have been to people who want to meet Jesus? What should he have said? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I will take you to meet Jesus. Let's go. He's right over here. We'll get you a meeting with Jesus. But Philip's a man who's done his study. And let's think about what Jesus has said in the past. I'm going to read you two passages here from Matthew. Listen to what Jesus says. This may have informed Philip's thinking on the matter. Matthew 10 verse 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay? Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. To whom was Jesus' primary ministry during his earthly time? His primary ministry was to Jewish the Jewish people. Without, without any question. <clears throat> He, he obviously, he ministered to the Samaritans. He ministered primarily in Galilee, which is full of Jews. And he ministered in Judea, which is full of Jews. And he, he would have gone through Perea, which was at that time also full of Jews. Okay? We don't have any record of Jesus taking ministry trips into Gentile areas. Jesus' primary ministry was to Gentiles. Did Jesus ever have anything to do with Gentiles? <clears throat> yes, absolutely, he did. <clears throat> but is it possible that, that Philip is kind of overthinking this a little bit? Because he's got two Greeks. Greek, they're Gentiles. That's what the word means. They're, they're Greek-born, Greek-bred. They're actual Greeks. They come up and they say, we want to see Jesus. Again, I'm, I'm trying not to read too much into it, but is it possible that Philip might be overthinking it a bit, given what we know about Philip? <laughs> I think it's not only possible, it's likely. He's a man who overthinks stuff. Jesus had also said in John 6, verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast down. We have instances in Scripture of people, Gentiles, coming to Christ and being saved. The, the ten lepers, you remember the ten lepers? One of them came back to say thank you. He was a Samaritan. The woman at the well, another, a Samaritan. There, were, there was a handful. There weren't many because Jesus' primary focus was to the Jews. But Gentiles did come. 
to Philip's credit, <clears throat> what does he do? Well, look at your text. He, <laughs> he calls Andrew. <laughs> because, because why? Because Andrew's really good at getting people to see Jesus. He says, Andrew, these guys want to see Jesus. They, they, Andrew will know what to do. Andrew and Philip take these Greeks to meet Jesus. Andrew helped Philip get to, to stop overthinking, perhaps, and get these men to the Messiah. Our last glimpse of Andrew is in John 14. <clears throat> Flip ahead to there. John 14. It's the upper room. John 14, 6. You know this verse by heart. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye shall know him and have seen him. What is Jesus doing in John 14, 6 and 7? He is claiming equality with whom? The Father. Jesus is saying, I am God. There's no, there's no other good way to, to read this. Look at verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. What? What? Given what Jesus just said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. Now, Philip, at this point, he obviously believes Jesus to be the Messiah. That's, that's without question. Philip had been quick to leave his occupation and follow Jesus, even telling others about him immediately. But now he says this. Lord, show us the Father. And that suffices us. That, that's all we want. Lord, Jesus, all we, all we need, just if we can just get a glimpse of the Father, that's, that's all we need. Look at Jesus' response, verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen, the fa he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Given what Philip and the other apostles had seen, should there have been any question as to who Jesus was? How many miracles has Philip gotten to look at? Up close. Countless. We don't have all the miracles recorded for us. Philip has been there when Jesus has raised the dead, cast out demons, healed the lame, healed the blind. He's been there for Jesus' teaching, all of the major sermons that Jesus preached that we have recorded. He's been there. He's walked on the streets with Jesus through the, uh, all over the countryside. He's been with Jesus this whole time, but he doesn't understand. He doesn't have a good understanding. Jesus goes on in verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. And then Jesus issues a command in verse 11. He says, believe me that I am in the Father, the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In other, word, in other words, Philip, all of the things you've seen over the last three years, all of those things, who did that? Only God can do that. Only the Father, and I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. We're one. Philip's faith was weak, even when it had visual support. But he stood in good company in this respect. <laughs> if you, you think about all of the disciples, all of them were a little bit squishy in that, that department at this point. And this is the last time that we see Philip. Mentioned by name, obviously. He's grouped in the apostles when we go through the book of Acts. But this is really it. This is the last time that we have Philip the apostle. The other times after this that you find Philip named, it's talking about Philip the deacon or Philip the evangelist. So what happened to Philip? Well, he would find his faith along with all the other apostles in the days following the resurrection. Philip would would spend time with the risen Christ. He would be taught by the risen Christ. 
this man, Philip, who knew the law and the prophets, would have those more fully explained to him by Christ himself. And Jesus would explain, this is what this means. This is what I've done. This is what this means. This is, this is what it means about me. And Philip would go on to preach the gospel far and wide. Church history is where we have to go to find out about Philip. It's believed the first of the disciples, the first of the apostles to die was James, the brother of John. He was killed in the first wave of persecution under Herod in Jerusalem. And many scholars believe that Philip was the next to die. About eight years following that, he died in a place called Heliopolis, which is in Phrygia or Asia Minor, be modern day Turkey. He was preaching to the multitudes when he was crucified. Some reports say that he also was crucified upside down, as was Peter. We don't know that for sure. He was crucified by a proconsul who was offended by the gospel. So he did find his faith. He, he ended up, he ended his life very similar to the way he began his life with Christ. The first thing he did when he found Jesus was he went and told people. And the last thing that he did with the breath that he had been given was he told people about Jesus. Philip was a man who seems to have been logical. Again, we don't, we don't have, what we've looked at tonight is really the vast majority of what we know about Philip. But he seems to be a logical man and a man who led a very well thought out life. And God can use people who are well organized. But we need to be careful, even in our organization, not to allow our organization or our planning to exclude the divine. When, when we look at the insurmountable task that is before us as believers and we say, boy, it's not even possible. Well, we, might be, we might be looking at it through human eyes. With men, it is impossible. But according to Mark 10, 27, with God... All things are possible. That was a lesson that Philip had to learn. And it's a lesson that he did learn before the end. Any thoughts or questions on Philip? What little we know of him. I think we could all be Philip. <laughs> the Bible says, your ways are not my ways, and my ways are not your ways. And Philip didn't understand the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Jesus, God, Jesus come to earth. Yeah. And somebody in this in this world that can explain it yep. thoroughly themselves. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. He he was a man given to facts. Yeah. And so sometimes the faith was difficult. Yeah. And that's true for all of us. <laughs> you know, as we've gone through this study and we look at each of the disciples, so far we've looked at five. We've got Peter, Andrew, James, John, and now Philip. I would say that there's a little bit of all of them in each of us. <laughs> all of us have the propensity for their pitfalls, and all of us have the possibilities for the ways that they were used. Good reminder to us. 